This lesson's over savings and investing. And the good news is, is that this is the last one in our economic series. So um, this will be the last that we talk about it. But it's one of the most important. So go ahead, start writing. In one minute, I will begin talking again. So last episode, we talked about banks, and one of the big things that banks do in totality, whether it's a commercial bank or it's an investment bank or even the Fed, is uh, typically about savings and investing. And the key thing underneath all this is interest rates. Interest rates are huge for saving and investing as well as lending. Um, but the basic idea is a savings account allows you to save money with added compound interest. Now, what compound interest is, is that it's the interest on the total amount of money in the account. So if you, for instance, annually you earn, as we have here, 5% interest. That 5% gets added to your account at the end of a fiscal year. And then if you don't touch that money then you will get 5% on the new balance that's in there. And that's why last lesson we said savings accounts are best if you keep putting money in. The more money you put into a savings account, the more money you get back. Now, 5%, typically you might get somewhere between 4 to 8% on a savings account. That is not a high interest yield rate. Uh, like a high interest yield, a high interest would be somewhere in the area of like 20 or higher. So if it's a single digit, that's not a whole lot. That's not going to generate a net value for you unless you have a lot of money in that account. So that being said, banks have other options for you. And there are what are called certificates of deposit or a CD. And a CD allows you to deposit a specific set amount of money and you get an interest, a fixed interest rate on that. That's where you can get some, a double digit in interest rate. And now that's the great part about it. So it's, they ask you to like deposit $1,000 and you might get 12% on it. Or if it's a really good time or banks really need money, you might get 20% interest on it or something like that. But what it means is that once you deposit that money, you can't take that money out. It is, and they usually do, there will be a set period of time. Most normal CDs you get will be, minimum might be five years, or uh, most of them are around like 10 years. And now you can get that money out, but then you don't get any of the interest on it. Um, and then you might have to pay a penalty to take it out before the time is due. But if you leave it there and you let, and you let the bank access that money, when you get it back, you'll get that plus a lot more. And of course, the CD amount can increase from up to like, you know, you can put in $10,000 if you have that. So generally what people will do is they'll save money in their savings account. And then when they hit a certain mark, then they'll take that money out of a savings account and put it into a CD. And uh, banks need that because that's what banks, you, how they use customer money to operate. So they, you give them that money for, say, 10 years, they can use that money to lend out to somebody else, or they can use it for uh, other different types of accounts. And then that's why when you get it back, they give you the extra money.
Now, we haven't talked about bonds uh, recently, and, but these are, things, these are loans taken out by our federal government to pay off debt. So the ones that are more commonly, that have been historically more commonly bought up by private citizens are war bonds. So if the country is at war, we haven't really had that since World War II, but if they need to pay for a war, they'll sell war bonds, and people can buy war bonds for a couple of hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars. And when the war is over, the government will pay them back that money with interest. And bonds typically are a safe investment because governments, whether they change politically, financially governments are fairly stable institutions. Um, so today our government still sells bonds, but they're in an astronomical amount because we always are carrying a heavy amount of debt. So those bonds are usually bought up by other governments um, or by really wealthy individuals that can drop you know, several hundred thousand dollars or several million dollars to invest in a bond that they're going to get back with, with a ton of interest eventually. So that's, uh, that's a form of investing. Another form of investing is stocks. And we've mentioned this previously, but like a stock is buying a small piece of a company or what is called a share. And so the, the more you own in a company and the better the company does, the more money you can generate. And the, uh, at the end, if you want to sell off that stock at that particular price, then, uh, then you make all that money. So the easiest kind of thing is, you know, um, you know people like to give the theory of, or of, if I could travel back in time, I'd invest in Apple, right? So it would be when Apple went public, Way back in the early 80s, you might have been able to buy into that company for $1 a share, right? So if you spent $100 for 100 shares, now each today each one of those shares might be worth uh, several hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. So if you bought you know, 100 shares and now they're worth $100,000, you'd have a million dollars that you could sell off in the stock market and take that for yourself. Um, so... Stocks are sold at stock exchanges like the one in New York City on Wall Street and the people that work there that buy and sell those stocks on your behalf are called stock brokers. Um, now, regular stocks can be risky because if a company fails, you get no money. So everything you put in, if the, if the price tanks and the company has to shut down, that money you invested is not returned. Now, you have two options here, which is uh, first is a mutual fund, which is protected by the government. So if you buy into a mutual fund, which is you invest a certain amount of money and then the people working that mutual fund put your money into different stocks and different companies. If that, if that mutual fund collapses or those businesses fail, the government will refund you your money. It, that is protected. Now, and so mutual funds usually spread their money out across a wide number of company, publicly traded companies to avoid that from happening. Now, then there's money market funds. These are more, this is more of a private investment. And that's kind of like taking a lot of your money and putting it into one company. Um, and so those are not protected by the federal government. They don't, they, if you, you invest that money and the money market collapses or that business fails, you don't get that money back at all. So that's why mutual funds are a safe way of investing. Money marketings can have, uh, can get you a lot of money quickly, but there's a much higher risk with that.
where the government steps in is regulating all of these different industries. So, like for instance, you have the Security and Exchange Commissions regulates stocks. Um, you have the Federal Reserve regulates banks. Um, and you have other different uh, regulatory agencies in the federal government that are there, that are typically there to protect the consumer. But they can only do what Congress passes. So the Congress has to pass r regulations on specific uh, parts of those industries in order to allow those agencies to operate. So uh, again, regulations can be from how many stocks a single person can buy, uh, to information exchange before markets open and how even brokers sell those stocks to consumers. So if you ever hear the term insider trading, that's illegal. That means, like for instance, if I owned a company and, I, uh, and you had stock or you had stock in another company and I called you up and said, hey, tomorrow we're going to be, I'm selling my company to this other company for X amount of dollars. If you invest in me right now, your stock price will go up and you'll make a ton of money. That's insider trading. That is illegal to do. It's unfair because not majority of consumers don't have access to that information. Um, so, um, Mainly, the government organizations that everyone approves of are the ones that protect consumers, like FDIC protects your accounts in a bank. In case that bank fails, you will always have that money. That money doesn't go away. You also have, like we said, those protections for like mutual funds in, in the stock exchange. Those are there uh, because, again, you cannot, sometimes you can't control the bad practices of people who are running those financial institutions that you've given your money over to. And then at other times, the United States lessens restrictions on banks, on investment houses, and things like that. And usually when that starts happening, the result is a financial crisis. So um, most recent one that had a lasting impact was back in 2008, uh, right when President Obama was coming into office. There was a gigantic financial crisis because it was based on uh, lending institutions. We're, we're giving home or we're giving home mortgages or home loans to people who they knew couldn't afford them. And then they threw tricky math. They split up those mortgages and then sold them to investment firms uh, to take that money and play in stock markets. And they did it all around the world. And when uh, at a certain point in time when people couldn't pay those loans, all that money just disappeared and it created a massive financial crisis here in the United States as well as in several European countries and Asian countries as well, nearly disrupting the entire world market. So historically speaking, what we've seen is, is that the more regulations to protect consumers the United States has, the stronger our economy typically is. The less restrictions might result in like peaks and valleys going up and down, up and down, and creates a higher risk of a recession or a depression in the future. And that's where we'll stop.